uh, our wireless transmission where we have a transmitter. It has some electrical signal. The antenna generates an electromagnetic waveform that propagates through the air and is received by our receive antenna and we get the resulting receive signal. With at any transmission system, we can talk about that we have some starting transmit power and we transmit a signal and we receive at the receiver some power at some receive power level, let's say PR, T transmit, R receive here. We know that when we transmit a signal that our signal gets weaker across some distance, it attenuates. So we want to know how much the signal attenuates by. When someone talks, how much audio strength is lost between the person talking and the person listening. Same as when our antenna transmits, how much power is lost between the transmitter and receiver. Some loss factor is involved here where mathematically we could say that the receive power is the transmit power divided by the loss factor where L is at some ratio or some factor. For example, if I transmit with a power of 1 watt that's the transmit power and I know, I measure between the transmitter and receiver, there's a loss factor, in this case, of 4. That means the receive power is 4 times weaker than the transmit power. We lose 4 times the strength. Therefore, the receive power is simply 1 watt divided by 4 or 0.25 watts. So in general, if we start with some transmit power, if we know the loss factor, how much we lose, how much does the signal attenuate across some distance, then we can find the receive power. We'd like to know how do we determine this loss factor? What impacts upon how much power is lost? That's what we'd like to know and that's what we'll cover today. So let's We'll come back to antennas uh, towards the end of this topic. We've gone through this, but we'll return to antennas. Let's look at how signals propagate in a wireless environment. The way that signals propagate depends upon one thing, uh, or multiple things. One of them is the frequency. So three different classifications of which the uh, way the signals propagate. We can say we have ground wave propagation, sky wave propagation, and line of sight propagation, where ground wave propagation is for signals with frequencies less than 2 megahertz approximately. And sky wave between 2 and 30 megahertz, so that, and greater than 30 megahertz line of sight propagation. With ground wave propagation, the propagation of the signal effectively follows the contour of the Earth. And it's due to the way that uh, the signal reflect, ref, refracts uh, through, is refracted by different obstacles. And these three different classifications are illustrated and best shown in, in this diagram. With ground wave propagation, we transmit from some antenna and it follows around the Earth. So here's the Earth here, we know it's a sphere. So our signal follows the Earth, allowing us, in theory, to transmit a signal all the way around the Earth. We don't have to have what's called line of sight between the transmitter and receiver. With sky wave propagation, we bounce the signal across, uh, we bounce the signal off of the Earth and the ionosphere. So the particles in the ionosphere, our signals at these frequencies uh, reflected from those particles. 
So it goes up. And again, we can cover around the curvature of the Earth by, if we get the right angle of reflection here, we can propagate this signal to a particular transmitter. Whereas line of sight, when we transmit a signal, it can only be received by a receiver that if you stood at the receiver and you had perfect eyesight, that you could see the transmitter. You have a line of sight between the transmitter and receiver meaning no obstructions between them. In particular, the Earth is not obstructing the signal. If you look at this bottom diagram, if you imagine the transmitter was placed here and the receiver here, they would not have line of sight because the Earth would be in between the transmitter and receiver. The different frequencies of our signals impact upon how it can propagate through some environment. And these are the three classifications which are commonly used. Many of the signals we deal with require line of sight propagation. Or well, the ones, the examples that you know of, mobile phones usually use frequencies of 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz and higher. Wi-Fi uses frequencies of 2.4 gigahertz, all much higher than 30 megahertz, so requiring line of sight propagation. Some of the lower frequencies uh, are some shortwave radio systems. You can pick up radio from stations from Europe, for example. So almost the other side of the world. Why? Because with a shortwave radio, a short, we have low frequencies of our signals and those signals can propagate uh, using ground wave propagation around the Earth. So the frequency of our signal impacts on how it propagates. This is not about uh, the signal strength getting weaker, it's about how it reflects and propagates through different obstacles. A more detailed classification of the different frequencies is shown in this table where we have different bands or common names for frequency bands, so ranging from extremely low frequency up to the visible light frequencies. So some of you you've heard of VHF and UHF, for example. They just refer to a range of frequencies. VHF 30 to 300 megahertz. The wavelength for those frequencies and the propagation characteristics, ground wave, GW, Sky wave propagation, SW, and then above that line of sight propagation. And some other characteristics. And we'll see shortly that our signals, when we transmit them, different obstacles cause different amounts of attenuation, make our signal weaker. Obstacles including in the atmosphere, water vapor, and so on. So we see some notes here that uh, in the medium frequency, things like atmospheric noise, uh, the attenuation at night may be lower than during the day because of the, the temperature and uh, the, the atmosphere. And in, where's the other example? In the super high frequencies, 3 to 30 gigahertz, Rainfall, that is rain, the water in the sky, can attenuate the signals. So above 10 gigahertz, our signals, when it hits the water droplet, it gets weaker. So as our signal passes through rain, it gets weaker, it attenuates, which means when it's received by your receiver, it can be too weak to be able to uh, interpret what the data was. And you may experience that sometimes with satellite TV transmissions. If they're using frequencies above 10 gigahertz and it's raining, the satellite TV reception can get uh, lower quality because the signal is getting attenuated by the water. And on the last column we give some examples of typical use of some of these frequency bands. Some of your UHF, VHF TV, FM broadcast, amateur radio, AM broadcast, infrared, uh, and some other examples, satellite communications. Yes. What is this? P 
PR is the receive power, PT is the transmit power, L is loss. The point here is that we transmit with some power, PT, power. We transmit with some power, PT, it gets weaker across distance. We lose some strength of that power. And we receive with some power, PR. The amount that we lose, here we designate as L, the loss factor. And as an example, if I transmit with one watt, and if I know my loss factor is four, that means the receive power is four times weaker than the transmit power. What we want to know is what impacts upon the loss. And in more detail, we'd like to be able to calculate what the loss would be in different environments which we're getting to in a moment. We see here, and on the next slide, what impairs our signal? What impacts upon the loss? Well, some of the factors are listed here. <coughs> listed here. The first thing, assuming there's no obstacles, assuming we're operating and sending a signal in a vacuum or out in space, there's no atmospheric effects, then our signal when we transmit gets weaker across distance. That's called free space loss. In the perfect conditions, we transmit with some signal strength. As the signal propagates, it will get weaker and weaker. And we'll see shortly we have an equation for by how much weaker does it get. It depends upon the distance and the wavelength of the signal. We'll see that in a moment. So that's free space path loss, that our signal gets weaker across distance. But there are other impairments on our signal. There are other things that make our signal worse at the receiver. The atmosphere, different uh, effects in the atmosphere, water and oxygen can uh, attenuate signals differently. Like I said, with rainfall, as the signals of high frequencies above 10 gigahertz hit the water droplets, as they come out the other side of the water, they're much weaker. Therefore, they lose energy. So they impair our signal. So for high frequencies, that's an issue. Signals can be refracted through the atmosphere, meaning only s some part of the wave is received. Remember, it's a, a wave. Multipath, we may receive multiple copies of a signal. Uh, an example is on the next slide. If you look at the second diagram, say you're using your mobile phone inside your car, driving along in a city. There's the mobile phone tower that's sending a signal. It propagates in multiple directions, but that signal may bounce off buildings. It's reflected. So depending upon the frequency of the signal, it will be re reflected, reflected off different obstacles. So in this case, our signal is received directly from the mobile phone tower. It's also received where it comes bounced off one building and of another building. Note that the distance that the signals, the three signals that are received by my mobile phone differ. That is, this is a short distance, this may be a medium distance, this is a much longer distance. And if the distance changes, the propagation time changes, that means that the mobile phone, trans the mobile phone tower transmits a signal, I receive the same signal, but at three different times. I receive this one, and then slightly later I receive a reflection from some building, and then slightly later another one. That can cause interference. If you think of the signal as being a sine wave, if this is one of them that I receive, and then I receive a reflection slightly later, Let's draw it a bit smaller. If that's the signal I receive directly, and then slightly later I receive the same signal, then in time, if it looks like this, Same shape, but there's a time offset here. 
This one starts at times x, this one times, times x plus y. Some time later I start receiving it. Then from my receiver's perspective, they add together. Add these together, what do you get? If they are aligned perfectly, if I could draw correctly, then you'd get a flat signal. That would be terrible because you're adding this plus this, they're the opposite of each other, we get zero. So this is a case where the same signal is transmitted, but we receive copies of it separated in time, so delayed slightly. And that may cause interference at the receiver. In the worst case, they overlap and uh, cancel each other out. Of course, that's the worst case. But even if it's shifted by a small amount, it affects the receive signal. That's what's called multipath interference. We receive the signal from multiple paths. In particular, inside cities where signals bounce off buildings and so on, that can be significant. And that impacts upon the quality of the signal that you receive. So there are different things that impact upon our wireless transmission. That is the signal that's received. To, in this topic, we're going to focus just on free space path loss, which is Assuming no other impairments, and assuming we're operating in a vacuum, when we transmit a signal with some power level across distance, as it propagates, it will get weaker and weaker. It loses power. By how much? Well, people have done analysis and come up with by how much. Let's give you the equation and then explain related to the next slides. If we have our transmitter uh, oh, not, with an antenna, draw it as a circle, an antenna, we transmit with some power level, PT. With a, let's say this is an isotropic antenna. And we transmit our signal, I'll draw it better. The signal has some frequency, F, which means some wavelength, where remember the wavelength is the speed of light divided by F. And we transmit across some distance to our receiver, distance D. And we have some received power then a guy called Friss, Friss, F-R-I-I-S, come up with a relationship of if we are operating in a vacuum in free space, then the amount of power we lose is expressed as the loss factor between the transmitter and the receiver, L. Can I remember? Is... L equals 4 times pi times the distance squared divided by lambda, the wavelength squared. So he did some analysis in, in a vacuum or in free space that the amount of power we lose if we transmit with PT a signal with frequency F or wavelength C over F across a distance D then the amount of power we lose, the loss factor L, is 4 times pi times the distance, all squared, divided by the wavelength squared. Or we can then write that if we transmit with some power PT, as we have over there, PR, the received power, equals the transmit power divided by the loss factor. If this turns out to be 10, what that tells us, if L is 10, it tells us that the received power will be 10 times weaker than the transmit power. Friss, F-R-I-I-S, is the name of a person. He 
he first developed this. That's not so important. What's important is this equation, and we're going to see it in the slides, but in slightly different form shortly. So we'll go through it here first. Remember, with any loss factor, if we transmit with some power, the received power will be the transmit power divided by the loss factor. PI equals PT over L. If we substitute in, then we get PR equals PT divided by this, which becomes lambda squared over 4 pi D squared. So it relates our transmit power and receive power together, and it depends upon the distance and the wavelength or the frequency of our signal. If we increase the distance, does the loss go up or down? If we increase the distance between our transmitter and receiver, does our loss go up or down? The loss goes up. D goes up. L goes up. In fact, if D is doubled, because it's squared here, L will go up by a factor of 4. Because it's, if everything else is the same, if D goes from 1 to 2, then this will go up by a factor of 4, because it's 1 to 2 squared, doubling. So doubling of the distance between transmitter and receiver quadruples the loss. As you increase the distance, the loss gets much larger. Very close, small loss, double the distance, uh, much uh, quadruple size of the, the power loss. What about our signal? The signal that we transmit, if we increase the wavelength, if the wavelength goes up, the loss goes down, okay? because we divide by the wavelength. And because the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency, if we increase the frequency of our signal, higher frequency, what happens with our loss? Increase the frequency, loss goes up. If F goes up, lambda goes down. If lambda goes down, L goes up because we're dividing by lambda. In other words, if we increase the distance, the loss goes up. If we increase the frequency, the loss goes up. So the amount of power we lose in free space or in a vacuum depends upon the distance and the frequency of our signal. Any questions on that before we move on? We'll see this equation in your slides in a moment. Yep. What is C? C is the speed of light. 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's, that's physics that you studied maybe five, five years ago. Okay. That's easy. The, lambda, the wavelength is C divided by the frequency. Speed of light divided by the frequency. This equation here is assuming we have these isotropic antennas, perfect antennas. Last week we started to explain that an isotropic antenna is an antenna that transmits its signal in all directions equally. If this is an isotropic antenna, if you measure the received power one meter away in that direction, and you measure it in the opposite direction, they'll be the same one meter away. And if you measure one meter above, it will be the same as one meter ahead and to the left and right. That is, the received power one meter away in any direction will be the same for an isotropic antenna. It radiates the energy in all directions with equal power. That's our isotropic antenna. 
An isotropic antenna, we think, is a theoretical antenna. It's, it's impossible to build one exactly like that, but we can get close. But many of our antennas are what we call directional. They concentrate the energy in a particular direction. That is, instead of radiating the energy in all directions equally, most of the energy is sent in one direction. In the other directions, the energy is much weaker. So that's our directional antenna. And with a directional antenna compared to an isotropic antenna, in that one direction, we get some gain. So we'll try and explain that gain and then come back to our equation on... So, so far we have our equation relating PR, PT, lambda and D, assuming isotropic antennas. close to this one, but we see that there's some other factors involved, gain, GT and GR. So we're going to go back to antennas a few slides and then return to this free space loss model. Talk about gain again. Gain of an antenna. An antenna takes some electrical current and generates some electromagnetic wave that propagates through the air and the receiver receives that wave and generates an electrical current. <coughs> We've said that we can have an isotropic antenna and then we have directional antennas. An omnidirectional antenna is, a, is a, a directional antenna where here's my antenna with an omnidirectional antenna the energy propagates in one plane in all directions equally. That is ahead of my antenna, behind, left and right, it radiates in equal power in each direction, but up it may be much weaker and down much weaker. That's an omnidirectional antenna. In one plane, say the horizontal plane, the energy goes the same, but going vertically it's much weaker. And in general, a directional antenna, we concentrate the energy in a particular direction. Let's try and see this concept of antenna gain, which relates our directional antenna with an isotropic antenna. You don't have this. And, in fact, it's not so useful to copy down. I think just try and follow the concept. You, we don't, you don't need to derive antenna gain. You just need to understand what it is so we can see it uh, in our path loss model. Of course, our antennas transmit in three dimensions. I can only draw in two dimensions. What this diagram shows, the black dot in the middle is the location of my isotropic antenna. It transmits with some power, PT. Okay, some power level, PT. Let's say one meter away from that antenna, I measure the receive power. So in this direction, one meter away, I measure the receive power and it's some value PR. So at this point I measure the receive power, it's PR. And at this point, which is also one meter away, I measure it. What's the receive power? PR. PR, it's the same because isotropic, the power radiates equally in all directions. If at any point one meter away from the transmitter, if we measure the receive power, we'll get the value PR whatever PR is. That is, at any point on this black circle, the received power is PR. That's our isotropic antenna. Now let's consider a real directional antenna. And I've tried to draw the same thing, but for a directional, a different antenna, the blue one. What this shows us the blue dot is my directional antenna. It transmits with the same power PT. And because it's directional, it's concentrating the energy in one direction. In this case, in this direction. If I measure the power at this point, so what this diagram is showing us, if I measure the power at this point, 
which is what? Maybe about two meters away from the transmitter. If I measure the power here, it is also PR. The same as the PR with our isotropic. If I measure the power at this point, which is what? About 1.3 meters away, I also get the received power of PR. And at any point along this blue line, the received power measured is PR. That's what the, the diagram shows us. In both cases, at any point along the black circle, the received power for an isotropic antenna is PR. And at any point along the blue line, the received power for our directional antenna is also PR, the same PR. As we note, we can see that in this direction, where the energy is concentrated, the, the signal gets further than our isotropic antenna. We concentrate the energy in one direction, the signal gets further at the same power level. But in the opposite direction, it gets less, covers less distance at the same power level compared to isotropic. Let's focus on the, this direction. With my directional antenna, the blue one, you measure the power at this red dot. What is the value of the power? Let's actually over here. With the first with the isotropic antenna. If I measure the power at the red dot, if I was using my isotropic antenna, what's the value of the received power? What's the value? With isotropic only, at this point, one meter away, the red dot, what is the value of the received power? Using the notation I've introduced here, PT, PR, and PX. What is the value of PX? Anyone? PR. Any point on this black circle, if I measure the power, by definition we say that the power level is PR. All right, it's just a variable. It could be a value, but we're just using a variable here. So with my isotropic antenna, I measure the value one meter away, and we get PR. Now, I use my blue directional antenna. At that same point, the red dot, I measure the power level, and let's say the value is PX some other power level. First, is PX greater than PT? Is it greater than or less than? PX, PX is less than PT. Why? Because we transmit with power PT. Over some distance, the power gets weaker. By how much, we don't know, but we know it gets weaker. We've covered one meter. Px is less than Pt, that's for sure. For any antenna, if we transmit a signal trans starting with power Pt and that signal covers some distance, that received signal is going to be less than the transmitted signal because we, we know that we lose power across distance. That was easy. Px is always less than Pt if we measure here. What about the relationship between Px and Pr? Is, what is, is Px... Px will be greater than Pr. Remember, this is for our directional antenna. Remember the blue line shows us if we transmit here at Pt, at this point, 
we will receive with power PR. That's the definition here. And the same at this point, we'll receive with power PR. And here PR. So we can see we're transmitting in this direction. Start with PT. If at this point we receive at PR, PX should be less than PT, but greater than PR. Because it's at a point in between those two points. If our signal gets weaker across distance, it starts at some level, it's getting weaker, 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 it's at some level PX, and weaker and weaker PR. PX is greater than PR. So, if I use my isotropic antenna at this red point, I receive power PR. If I use my directional antenna at that same point, the same distance from our antenna, I receive with power PX, which is greater than PR. We say the gain of my directional antenna is PX, this value, divided by the isotropic received power, PR. That's the gain of my directional antenna. That is, how much greater than PR is it? Let's put some numbers to them. If PT was 2 watts, just as an example, if PR was 1 watt, that is, transmit 2 watts, receive here with 1 watt, with our isotropic antenna, transmit here with 2 watts, receive here with 1 watt. And if it turned out with my directional antenna PX, here's 2 watts, here's 1 watt. If my directional was, say, 1.5 watts, somewhere between 2 and 1, if PX, so PR is 1 watt, if PX was 1.5 watts, then I'd say the gain equals 1.5 divided by 1. In other words, using my directional antenna at the same point, my signal is 1.5 times stronger than if I used an isotropic antenna. That's the gain of my antenna compared to an isotropic antenna. The, the, the gain factor in this case. And that's the definition of antenna gain. How much stronger is my directional antenna compared to an isotropic antenna in a particular direction? What if, instead of I measured here, the red dot was here, the red dot was here? What's going to happen? What's the gain going to be, do you think? If I measure here using my directional antenna, the received power using my directional antenna is going to be less than using an isotropic antenna. Because with the directional, power is concentrated in this direction. It's very weak in this direction. So at this point, using my directional antenna, the received power will be weaker than if I used an isotropic antenna. As a result, the gain would be less than one. It would be a loss, in fact. A gain above one is an increase. A gain less than one is a decrease. When you go and buy an antenna, a normal characteristic or part of the specification says what is the gain of the antenna. And it's normally talking about the gain in the, the maximum gain in the direction which it points. In fact, there's a you will see plots or diagrams that show the pattern of the gain in different directions. It's high in this direction, it's low in this direction for some, for example. This gain is an absolute factor, a gain of 1.5, as an example. Of course, gains, we know, we can convert to a logarithmic value. 
decibels. A gain of 1.5 is the same as 10 log 1.5. What's the logarithm of 1.5? Calculator, someone? Log of 1.5. 0 0.17 something. Multiply by 10. 1.7. Decibels and the gain is relative to an isotropic antenna. So the notation that's used here is not 1.7 dB but 1.7 dBi, where the I means isotropic. That is, my antenna, my directional antenna, has a gain of 1.7 decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. It's 1.5 times stronger than an isotropic antenna if measured at the same point. And that's the common, uh, the way that you'll see a gain specified for an antenna. When you look at a specification of an antenna, you'll see that it has a gain usually measured in dBi. For example, the access point, I think these uh, two antennas have a gain of about 2 or 2.2 .2 dBi. You can go to a shop and you can, you can unscrew these antennas. You can buy new ones which are longer. They have a higher gain. The shape the design of the antenna, the size of the antenna, impact upon the gain. We'll see the relationship shortly. Any questions on antenna gain? It's a measure of how much stronger our, our antenna is compared to an isotropic antenna. Everything okay? Yeah. Ready for the exam next Tuesday? No. I <laughs> can we use the calculator? Calculator can be used in the exam and is recommended. If you want to calculate logarithm of 1.7, <laughs> I recommend you use a calculator. And there will be calculations such as that. The hints on the exam are online. We may say a bit more about it tomorrow, but the hints give you all that I'm going to give you, I think. Uh, the types of questions or the, the number of questions and in fact in the hints it includes the first page of the exam and you'll see that some of the equations we go through today are given in the exam but you need to know how to apply them. Antenna gain measured in dBi the power of our directional antenna compared to an isotropic antenna. Now, returning to our free space path loss, what we did earlier assumed we had isotropic antennas. What if we have non-isotropic antennas? Well, if we transmit with some power level with a antenna with a gain of G, that gain means we increase the power. It's a multiplier. A gain is a multiplier. So we can adapt this equation. Now if we use directional antennas, real antennas, so this antenna is no longer isotropic but a directional antenna, And the antenna has a gain of GT. The transmit antenna has a gain of GT. And the receive antenna has a gain of GR. Then what we think is that we have a transmit power. The transmit antenna increases the power. We lose power here according to L, the loss the receive antenna increases the power and we get the receive power. 
The gains are multipliers here. They increase the power. So what we get here is we introduce into this equation the received power is the transmit power divided by the loss here lambda well, 4 pi d squared on lambda squared let's write it received power is the transmit power we start with the transmit power but now we have a gain of gt so we increase the power multiplied by gt a gain is a multiplier. We lose power as we transmit the signal. The amount of power we lose is L. And at the receive antenna, we again increase the power because we have a receive antenna compared to our isotropic antenna of a gain of GR. So another multiplier here. This was when we had isotropic antennas. When we have real antennas, we need to take into account the gain of those antennas. The received power is equal to the transmit power increased by the gain of the transmit antenna, increased by the gain of the receive antenna, and decreased by the loss across the free space between the two, where the loss is given by this equation. If we substitute in this value of L, we get PT, GT, GR, lambda squared on 4 pi d squared. Where'd you go? which with some rearrangement is this equation. Here we just put PT over PR, but if you put uh, PR on the other side and rearrange, you'll get this same equation. This is our general free space path loss equation. What it tells us is a relationship between transmit and receive power. Given that we know the gains of the antennas, the transmit and receive antennas, GT and GR, the distance between the two, and the wavelength of the signal that we're sending. This is a model. By model, we mean it's some theor theoretical uh, interpretation of how much power we lose between transmitter and receiver. It makes some assumptions. The assumption in this case is we're operating in free space. Free space means a vacuum. That is, there's no, uh, well, not a vacuum in terms of you clean your carpet at home, but a vacuum in terms of if physics. Okay? There are no atmospheric effects. Free space refers to out in space where there's no uh, atmospheric effects. Are we operating in free space when I transmit from my laptop to the access point? No. no. There are different effects. For the signal to propagate from the laptop to the access point, there is the atmosphere. But there's also obstructions like this table. In fact, the signal may propagate and bounce off the walls and so on. So this model assumes free space. But in real life, we do not send our signals in free space. We have different obstructions. People have come up with other models of how much power do we lose. Some models that work in cities, they take into account that we have high-rise buildings, our signals bounce off them. Some models which are particular or specifically designed for television broadcast. TV station, has a, tra a tower that transmits the signal. In your home, you have some antennas on your TV, not for satellite TV, but terrestrial TV. And it has a model of how far we can send the signal from the TV station to reach many people. 
and some models for transmission inside. When I transmit inside, we, our signals often need to pass through walls, through the ceiling, through people. They cause attenuation and we get more, more path loss. So there are different mathematical models for how much path loss occurs. This is the free space path loss which we'll use, but there are others. So in summary, the loss, if I measure the loss from my laptop to the access point, I have a device that measures the signal strength coming out of my laptop and measures the signal strength going in to the access point. The ratio between them is the loss factor. That is, it starts strong, it gets weak. By how much is this factor L? And it depends upon the distance, the wavelength, and in practice, obstructions and the atmosphere. You need to be able to calculate and solve problems using this free space path loss model for the exam next week. Before we go through an example, any questions? Everything is clear? You're ready for the exam next week? Yes, good. I hope to see 100%. Yeah. In case of uh, not a free space. Mm -hmm. in, in real life, we don't have free space. The reason we use free space is because it's easy. It's an easy mathematical model. Uh, but in real life, it's not accurate. There are other mathematical models which are more accurate. Some of the names are listed here, Longley Rice, Log Distance, and so on. Uh, so they're the names of some other models. And they're usually they're designed in some case based upon uh, theory, sometimes based upon measurements. They're just different equations that relate the transmit and receive power together. Look in the past exam, you'll see some, an example of a different model. Yeah? GT is not always equal to GR. GT is the gain of the transmit antenna. GR is the gain of the receive antenna. They may be different size, different shapes, therefore they may have different gains. In, I think in the example we'll go through it's the same, but in general they are not the same. They can be different. This is just the equation. Of course, if this had the value of 1000 and this 100, we'd substitute in. Yes, this is the formula for finding, we're well, relating power, receive and power transmit. That is, this yeah. is this formula, same one. But it's like kind of inverse of it. Well, rearrange things. You, PR equals PT. If you bring PR to this side, bring these to that side, bring these to that side, you get this. Okay? It's just a rearrangement. Again, that's high school mathematics to re rearrange. Easy. You'll see in the exam that this is given. I think this one is given, or one of the forms is given. If you need it in a different form, you need to rearrange it. If I ask you, find the gain of the transmit antenna, if you know all the other values, then you can rearrange and find the gain. It's okay, you can ask me. Okay. The derivation is not important, it's just to explain where these factors come from. The main examples, what you'll see in exams is, here's the equation, here's some information, solve for one of those values. Given all the values, find D, or given all the, va all the other values, find PR or something. 
or given a different model, find D or PR or PT, given the equation. The one important thing is to remember the, the units used. Power, the power units must be the same. If PT is in watts, PR will be in watts. If they're both in milliwatts, that's okay, but they need to be the same units, P, the power levels. The gains are absolute values. They have no units. A gain of 1.5, for example, it's not in dB. The gain are absolute values. D is in metres, wavelength in metres. One more thing before we go through an example. Going back to antennas. So far, we've said the antenna gain is a characteristic of the device. When you buy an antenna, you'll see on the spec the gain of this antenna is 2.2 dBi, as an example. In fact, we can calculate the antenna gain. Here's a way for calculating the gain of an antenna. It depends upon the effective area of the antenna. What's the effective area? Well, it depends again on the shape of the antenna. The antennas on this access point have some shape and would have some effective area if you measure the size of the antenna. But the antenna in the screen on the back of my laptop is usually some flat antenna, would have a different effective area. And the antennas, you often see those parabolic dish antennas with satellite TV, a dish antenna again have some effective area. The gain of an antenna is 4 times pi times the effective area of the antenna divided by the wavelength squared. The effective area is related to the physical size. It differs amongst different antennas. For example, and this is just an example, a parabolic antenna. A parabolic antenna is one of those dish-shaped antennas. So it's a parabola. So it's not a flat disc, it's, it's curved. The effective area of a parabolic antenna may be one half of its physical area. Let's give an example. And let's make some space because we'll need it. Let's say I have a parabolic dish antenna. Does anyone have one? Or a seen one, maybe at home, maybe the True Visions TV antennas, how big are they at home? How big? This big, this big, the big as them, are they like them? About 50 centimetres, so that the red dishes you'll see for True Visions are about what, this size. So it has a diameter of about 50 centimetres. Let's say we have a bigger one, one which has a diameter of one metre. Just for an example, a parabolic dish antenna one metre across. A radius of half a metre. It's parabolic, but let's assume that it's a flat dish. Right, it's not curved like this, but it's flat. What's the area of that flat dish? The area. Well, how are you going to calculate it? What's the area? Flat dish, circle, radius of half a meter, the area is pi r squared, okay? One of these dish antennas, all right, it's not entirely flat, so it's slightly larger, but let's assume it's flat, then the area is just a circle, 
So the area is pi r squared. Pi times 0.5 squared. And let's assume now this is the thing that would have to be given. The effective area of that antenna is half of the physical area, the real area. And that depends upon the shape of the antenna. So the effective area, AE, is a half of this. 0 0.5 times pi times 0 0.5 squared, which is pi over 8. Which is what, about 3.1 divided by 8. This value would need to be given to you. I would need to tell you in the exam the effective area of a parabolic antenna is a half of the real area, for example. It could be a different value. Or the effective area of antenna is a particular value, say, for the antennas on the access point. What's the gain of this antenna? Quite simple. The gain, 4 times pi times our effective area pi over 8 divided by lambda squared. Lambda is the wavelength of the signal that we're going to send. Let's assume, and it's C over S is the answer, but let's give a value for F, and the value I'm going to use is in this example here, F of 5 gigahertz. 5 times by 10 to the power of 9. So lambda equals C over F, which equals 3 by 10 to the power of 8, divided by 5 gigahertz, 5 by 10 to the power of 9, which is 0 0.06. 0 0.06, put it into here. And it's 4 times pi squared times 0 0.06 squared, or divided by 0 0.06 squared divided by 8. You can use your calculator. It's approximately 1,370. All right, that's where you need your calculator. What that says is that this 1 meter dish antenna, if you measured the received sec signal strength 1 meter away from it, it would be 1,370 times stronger than if you measured the received signal strength of an isotropic antenna one meter away. It's 1,370 times stronger than an isotropic antenna. That's the gain of that antenna. This antenna with a diameter of one meter. Make the antenna bigger the gain goes up. If the area increases, the gain increases. So normally the larger the antenna, the larger the gain. Similar, you can buy an antenna for this access point which is longer. It's larger and it gets a larger gain. So you can buy external antennas for your laptops or USB devices. Larger, longer gain, larger gain. The access points that don't have antennas have antennas built into them inside. So they do have antennas. Is it better than this? Uh, it depends upon the shape and the design of the antenna. It depends upon the device. The gain is in the equation on one of the previous slides. This is the gain. No, this is a gain of any antenna. That is, if my transmit antenna is this one, then that's GT. If my receive antenna had a diameter of two meters, that will calculate the gain for that one as well. So the antennas may have different gains. Let's go to our example. We need to finish that in the last few minutes. In this example, and maybe it's not the best because I 
Let's say in this example there are two antennas of the same size. GT and GA will be the same. In this example only. In another example, if I said one antenna diameter one, another antenna diameter two, you would need to calculate the gain of the other antenna. Okay. The, I just did this to make it simple in this example. So now in the example, we have our, let's draw it a bit better, we have, in fact we have the values here. We have a distance of one kilometre, d equals 1,000 metres. We have two parabolic dish antennas, one metre diameter. We've just calculated with such dish antennas the gain to be 1,370. So the gain of the transmit antenna is 1,370 and of the receive antenna, in this case only, is the same. It doesn't have to be. The frequency is 5 gigahertz. Therefore the wavelength is 0 0.006. We calculated that before as well. Transmit power is 1 watt. The question says, what is the required receive power threshold of the receiver? What that means is that, what is the minimum power that the receiver needs to be able to successfully receive? When you buy a device, the receiver, a part of the specification will normally say what's the minimum power it can successfully receive, called the receive power threshold or sometimes the receive sensitivity. How sensitive is the receiver? The lower the value, the more sensitive it is. That is the lower power signals it can receive. So if Let's say my device one, I, I've got two devices to choose from. One has a, let's say, receive, receive power threshold, just receive threshold. I go to a shop and I want to buy one and the, the salesman says, this device has a receive threshold of 50 microwatts and a second device has a receive threshold of 40 microwatts. What that means is that device one, if it receives a signal of 50 microwatts or larger, it can understand that signal. It can successfully receive. If device one receives a signal with a receive power less than 50, milli 50 microwatts, it will not understand the signal. It's too weak. Same as your ears have some receive power threshold. If the audio is too weak, you will not be able to hear, even though there is some signal being received. And device two, if the signal is greater than 40 microwatts, it will be successfully received. We'd say device two is more sensitive than device one. It can receive much weaker signals. In this question, we use this equation to find PR, the receive power. We know PT. Using this equation, PR equals PT, which is one, what? Times by GT, which is 1,370 times by GR, also 1370, times by lambda squared. And lambda we have as 0.06. All divided by 4 pi d squared, 4 times pi times 1000 meters, all squared. and you'll use your calculator and you get, what do you get? 
I did it this morning. 42.8 microwatts. About 43 micro microwatts. What that tells us, we've got a transmitter and receiver separated by one kilometer, 1,000 meters. We have two one meter dish antennas, have gains of 1,370 using a 5 gigahertz signal. We transmit with 1 watt. It goes into the antenna, it increases the power, the antenna. As the signal propagates across that 1 kilometer, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. The receiver antenna increases the power. The resulting power is 42.8 microwatts. No, you would calculate that because in the exam you'll have a calculator. If you just leave it as this, then you would not get full marks in the exam. You'd get most marks, but give me the final answer. What is that device, what is that device? All right. So in this scenario, the received power would be 42.8 microwatts. Now let's say I now go to a shop and I want to buy the receiver. The salesperson says, here are two devices you can choose from. One has a received power threshold of 50 microwatts, the other 40 microwatts. The 40 microwatts one is more expensive. Which one do I buy? Device one is cheaper than device two. Device one is cheaper than device two, but it won't work because device one can receive a minimum of 50 microwatts. Anything less than 50, it will not understand. In my scenario of one kilometre distance, the received power I'm going to get is 42.8 microwatts. So the device, the receiver that I buy, must be able to be able to receive something of at least 42.8 microwatts. That is, I should buy device two, because that can successfully understand anything above 40, including 42.8. Device one cannot understand anything below 50. The signal received by device one will be too weak for it to understand. You can only understand 50 and above. If it's less, it's too weak. So the received power threshold is normally a characteristic of a device when you buy it. when you look at the specifications of your iPhone or your Blackberry then you'll probably see the wireless chip has a receive power threshold also a transmit power from that you can do calculations of how far could you transmit using that device you could also find out the gain of your antenna on your iPhone for example if you could find the detailed spec so that's an example of how we can use this free space path loss model. We can, given all but one of the parameters, we can find that one. Another question may be, here's the transmit and receive power, here are the gains, tell me the distance that you can communicate between two, a transmitter and receiver. Or tell me what power should I transmit at if I want to transmit a distance x and receive at a power level of y. So you can answer questions using that. Let's summarize. We have isotropic antennas. They radiate power in all directions equally. They are theoretical antennas. Our real antennas concentrate power in a particular direction. The increase in power, let's say one meter away from the transmitter of my real antenna compared to an isotropic antenna is called the antenna gain. It's commonly expressed, so the antenna gain here is the absolute value, but it's commonly expressed in dBi. So you take the logarithm, multiply by 10 and you'll get the gain in dBi. When we transmit a signal, 
we start with a transmit power. The transmitting antenna increases that signal according to the gain. As the signal propagates through the air, it loses power. The free space path loss model tells us how much power it loses. We've removed it. The value of L is how much it loses, the loss factor. The receive antenna gain has a gain, so increases the power. The result is PR, the receive power. So it relates these factors together. Tomorrow, we're going to finish with three quick examples of different wireless transmission systems. And then we have about 30 minutes to cover on the next topic, because you have questions on it in the exam. Have a look at the exam hints. We'll get a chance to ask and answer questions about them tomorrow. It's online. You can download the exam hints. Form your groups of three for the assignments. Write them on a piece of paper, give them to me now or tomorrow, or send me an email with a group of three students for the assignment. We'll explain the assignment after the midterm. And we'll see you tomorrow for the last lecture.